Hi, welcome to Fiber Chats. My name is Irina, I'm the host here, and my guest today is Diego Juarez. I want to try to say one thing. So I was practicing um, this morning, my Navatl, and <laughs> I've learned how to say penalty, like illicitly. Is that? Penalty, uh, <laughs> 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 like illicitly, yeah. That was my first, so that means hello. Hello. Happiness. Uh -huh. Basically, so your name, uh -huh. yeah. your name means happiness in, in Navatl. Yeah, Nahuatl. It's pronounced Nahuatl. Right. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about that. Uh, you came to the U.S. when you were four, right? Yes. And you basically, like, you grew up in California. You went to school there. Why is your background so important to you? Well, I came to the United States so young. I came at four years old. So I didn't really have a very strong connection to my culture or my heritage when I came here. So when I grew up, I grew up as, I would say like Mexican, but Mexican American more like that. And because of that, I always wanted to reconnect with my roots, reconnect with my culture. And because of that, uh, in college, I started looking for information about my background. So I joined like dance teams. And then I, I also joined, well, yeah, I, I joined dance teams and I took a lot of history classes to find out more information. So you also have um, a Scorpio name that the dance yeah. team gave you. And I'm not going to try to pronounce that. I'll ask you to say that. Because <laughs> it's really long, right? That one? Right. I was, I was yeah, actually I, practicing it, but there is so many parts to it. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, I found out later that it's misspelled. It's actually missing an L. So it's supposed to be Atlachinolcolot, but the person who gave me the name didn't add the L. But anyways, um, it, it's a really long name, but I've shortened it to Kolotzi, which is mean, means little um, little uh, scorpion. Why scorpion? Why is it important animal in your life? Like, why do you feel connected to it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so people always ask me, why <laughs> why do you use a scorpion if you're, because I'm not a Scorpio, but, and you know, astro astrology is really popular right now. So people are constantly asking me, are you a Scorpio? Um, do you come from a state called Durango? Because apparently they also use a scorpion as their symbol. And I always have to say like, no, I don't. It's more that I use this symbol as like a, like something to strive for, something that kind of represents me as a person, somebody who's determined, who has a lot of passion. And so for me, it's just more of a symbol of something that I want to be or that I already am or turn, I am turning into. Right. And you have this beautiful tattoo on your arm of Scorpio. Yeah. And you also did the, was it the wrap? Is the Scorpio that you created? Oh, I, yeah, I did a, a, a shawl that's a scorpion um, that, I, yeah, I have, a, well, I don't have it anymore, but I did a scorpion shawl. And then also one of my pieces has like a scorpion right in the center of it. Right. So that scorpion is supposed to represent me as a person. And you actually drew that Scorpio. Yes. So, okay, like, let's go back. Let's go to your childhood, right? You are 10 year old, you're going to the library and you start looking at the crocheting and tapestry books. Like why, why is there such fascination mm -hmm. with the fiber arts so early? Well, it wasn't, I actually never knew what crochet was until I was 23. <laughs> but um, I was, when I was younger, I was look, going to the library, like you said, around 10. Um, to look for books on how to make things. So I've always liked making things. And I, I don't necessarily, I wasn't necessarily looking for knitting or anything specific. It was just more like, let's try stuff out. Let's see what I can find. And eventually I, I stumbled into books about knitting, but um, I already had learned how to knit from my mom at that point. So I, ha I have known to knit for a long time. I only know the basics by the way. <laughs> and um uh, why it's just I have a, a lot lifelong passion for learning so I just want to learn a lot of things a lot of a wide variety of things right and when did you start drawing like when did that passion started you know I actually just started maybe like four four years ago drawing because I actually I, I would say that I've always had the talent for drawing but I never actually try to work at it so um, I would say that my whole life, I think I've had it always in me, but I haven't actually tried like drawing stuff out until a couple of years ago. So it's not, it's not something that I'm like amazing at, but I, it is something I want to explore and I, I feel like I have a natural ability to do it. 
I don't know. I sort of disagree. I think you are amazing at it. Like from what yeah. <laughs> looks pretty amazing to me. Well, well, thank you. I, I don't think I, you know, I do design my, my pieces by drawing them out. So, but I, I think I've improved on it. Right. I just think it's a natural talent. Like I haven't really tried hard to make it better. Right. Oh, I, I want to make it better. <laughs> so when did you start crocheting actually? I started back in 2010. Um, so since I've had that experience for a long time of wanting to learn a lot of new things, um, uh, I just try stuff out. So one, of, one day I was just knitting at home um, on the couch and then my mom saw me knitting. She actually taught me how to knit, but um, she was see watching me knitting and she's, she asked me like, what are you doing? Like, like, have you heard of crochet? And I said, no, I don't even know what that is. <laughs> I actually didn't know at that time I was like 23 and she was like okay let me show you so she sat there for maybe like 20 minutes just showing me just the basics of how it works and I, I started looking at it and said okay oh my god like I could start seeing so many possibilities because uh, compared to knitting uh, crochet is more free you can create more like shapes more like easily versus knitting has a lot more technique involved and so I just saw so much flexibility with crochet when I started looking into it. And I was, I was amazed and I could really see myself doing a lot with it. Well, explain to me, because I'm like a rookie at crocheting, like the only thing uh, I know is the basic stitches, right? Explain to me, what's the difference between crocheting and like how we usually think about it and crochet tapestry that you do? Ah, okay. So, well, tapestry crochet allows you to make pictures out of yarn. Um, so most of the time when I see other crochet pieces out there, mostly it's to make um, make like hats or, or shawls or, or general patterns, but generally they use just one color or one color thread, sometimes two, sometimes three. But with tapestry crochet techniques, essentially what you're doing is you can add as many colors as you want, wherever you want to add them. And so what's different is the amount of colors and um, the technique is also slightly different. So um, something that um, if you go look for books on uh, tapestry crochet, you'll, you'll know that the technique is slightly different in the way that you change colors, but also in the way that you crochet every other row. So normally, uh, at least the way my technique works is you crochet the regular way, which is called forward single crochet. But on the second row, you, um, you have to insert the hook from back to front to crochet backwards so that the same side of the stitch is on the same side um, consistently across every row. So right. mm -hmm. is that something you created or is that no. something you've seen before? Uh, I actually learned that from Carol Ventura. So Carol Ventura, if you go look her up, you'll find that she's like one of the people who started Tapestry Crochet. So when I was exploring crochet, one of the books I ran into was hers and also her videos on YouTube. And so I learned that specific technique from her. Right. So let's talk about your first tapestry crochet project. What was it? Uh, it was a very simple, well, in my mind, simple, a three colored, no, well, see. Okay, so I made a bag first, the very first tapestry crochet bag, if you could call it. It was a blue and white mini bag, about six inches, that had just two colors that I drew out on graph paper. That was the very first one. But I would say that that was using double crochet rather than single crochet. So it's slightly different than what I do now because now I only use single crochet. So when I actually started applying single crochet um, was the second piece, which was like a mini flower, uh, geometrical flower that has blue, yellow, and pink. Um, that was the first, I, guess, I would say the true first tapestry crochet piece that I made. It's, it's a very small little piece, but that was the very first piece I would say. Do you still have it? Yes. So like when you look at it now, uh -huh. uh, what do you think? Like where, how do you see your journey from that first piece to where you're now? It, I actually see a big difference because um, my technique has changed. Um, when I started that very first piece, my technique was kind of um, not, the color changes weren't as smooth. So I changed the way that I crochet now so such that the, color, the lines are smoother and the, the color differences are more clear, the color contrast is more clear. If you go look at uh, normal or typical uh, crochet pieces, when they change colors, you'll notice that there will be like a little bit of like jaggedness or 
the color changes won't be so crisp. And that's how I started out with my first piece. The color changes aren't very crisp, although it doesn't look bad, but it doesn't look bad at all. Um, but I can tell that my color changes have improved. Right. So do you have like, I mean, you since then you've made so many different pieces. Is there a favorite? Like, is there one okay. that you like, if you will have to show it, it's gonna be that one? You definitely, I have it here with me if you want to see it. Absolutely. But it's 100%, this is my favorite one, hold on. Okay, so this this is like probably my second most recent one. This one has, um, this is, I call it, um, what are you, uh, so let me see. Um, no Yoloitic, which means inside of my heart. And um, it has essentially wings and it has a scorpion right at the bottom. I don't know if you could see the scorpion. Yeah. But um, essentially this one I feel is my most favorite because it represents I, me as a person, like the scorpion in the center and then the wings of like being free, being wanting to express yourself, the, the, um, the blue and the, uh, the blue and then the red and orange as like a contrast of extremes of personality. There's a lot of meaning for me in this piece. Well, I wanted to ask you about that because every picture of yours that I've seen on Instagram, it almost like immediately pops to my mind that there must be a story behind each piece. Like there is something like very detailed, like you have a piece about Chichen Itza, like who is the pyramid on one side and the flowering cactus on the other side. And I've watched your video on YouTube how you, when you explained like the, the reasoning why you chose those pieces and how you created that and what does it mean to you? Like, do you always approach every design like that with the story first? Pretty much, yeah. So, um, yes, I, it's always like I have an idea, a vision of like an idea of what I want to portray. And then I create the picture afterwards. So there is usually a meaning behind it. It's not usually like, oh, this is pretty. It, it'll be like something more than that. Like, for example, this piece, the one with the wings ha represents me as a person. But then other, like, uh, other ones that I have uh, here represent like seeing yourself as beautiful or, um, yeah. So th they are, there's always some kind of story, some kind of meaning of why I made it. You also mentioned to me that you see, that you see <laughs> numbers in colors. Yeah. So um, mm -hmm. a color is like very important to you. Like, do you assign a story to the color as well? Um, I would say yes. Um, colors are very important to me. I'm one of those people that loves wearing bright colors or wearing things that are flashy. And, um, but, uh, but yes, I, I would say that I do assign meaning to colors. Um, and I think that that's what I represent in my art. Do you feel like it's uh, like when people see your things, they like when I scroll through Instagram, right? I don't even need to look at your name. I know it's your piece just by seeing it, just by Ooh. how colorful it is. And by <laughs> that's <colorful>. fire. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just want to say that's fire. <laughs> I use that fire emoji a lot. Okay, sorry, continue. <laughs> it's like, is that your like, personalities that your vision for all your pieces do you want the people know that it's yours without even knowing that it's yours yes but I would say not not necessarily on purpose even though it, now it is uh, I would say that it's just my personality it's just my style it's the way that I express myself so it comes out that the same way every time so people do recognize it but it's, it's because I'm just consistent on what I like and what I envision. Right. Well, I wanted to ask you a different question. So I was telling about you to my husband. I was like all excited that no. I'm interviewing you and <laughs> I was showing him pictures and I was telling him that you have a doctor's degree in pharmaceutical sciences. And yes. he says, well, how do you explain that? Like somebody who is a pharmacist, right? his doctor degree like you would think he's this uh very serious guy who is like this is what he likes how do you explain the fact that you even crochet or like you're doing all those things like 
you know that is a very good point because a lot of people tell me that I have like two extremes one extreme is like the super logical like let's get stuff done um let's yeah like pharmacy is very serious it's very logical it's very you know very there's a lot of rules versus me my personality is actually kind of opposite where I'm more like free like let's do things let's do things brightly and, and stuff so it's I see the contradiction as well and I don't really have an explanation other than to say this this is just who I am <laughs> but uh, but yeah I would say that when I inter like I interviewed pharmacists other pharmacists for my job currently because I just hired two new pharmacists and they said like I haven't met a pharmacist that's more like excited <laughs> randomly excited about things I'm like well that's just me this is my personality Right. Well, do you feel like, well, let's, let's say just hypothetically speaking, you mm -hmm. didn't find crochet for yourself. Yeah. Can you imagine your life without it? Like what would, what different thing would you do? Well, uh, I mean, I, honestly, crochet did kind of just, I just kind of stumbled upon crochet because I was going to just be a, a pharmacist and be like, look, you know, this is my job. And I do currently still do it. So it is my job. It is what I do. Um, so I would have probably stayed with that. Um, another thing that I really like is computer programming. So perhaps I would have been a computer programmer or something like that. But I know that I if I didn't find crochet, I'd probably find something else to be creative with. Just I'm not exactly sure it would have been crochet, but it, I think it would have been something else. Right. So one of your pieces is basically a picture of you as a dancer. Like oh yeah. And then you have another piece where there is a beautiful woman also a dance in a dancing pose. So talk about dancing, like how, what role did it play during your college life? Why did you decide to dance? And, and I also mm. know like this Aztec uh, history, like they, they put a lot of history into dance. Like every movement has some meaning, every uh, decoration has some meaning, like- yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that connected with your crocheting, you feel like? Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, this all comes back to me trying to recover or, um, uh, yeah, basically recover my cultural roots. It all, ha it all comes down to that. So when I was in college, essentially, I involved myself in like dance groups so that I could recover part of my history, part of my culture. So um, I joined something called Ballet Folklorico, which is like folk dancing, Mexican folk dancing. And then I also jo joined the Aztec dance group um, at that time as well. And I I'm still somewhat part of some of the events that happen randomly in different parts of California. Um, but uh, I would say that trying to recover my roots led me to joining the dance groups and joining the dance groups eventually led to my inspiration for a lot of my pieces. So it's all like one continuous story, I guess, of wanting to discover my past and then using dancing and then that dancing using, uh, being like inspiration for my art or at least some pieces. And then I saw that you started beading at some point and you yes. made those beautiful, like, I mean, super sophisticated beading pieces. How did that start? Like, did you feel like you're not challenged enough with crochet? <laughs> well, actually the ones that you've seen me wear, I haven't made those, but I'm in the process of learning. I have this uh, amazing, beautiful book right here that is showing me how to create them. So eventually they will be my pieces, but the ones that you've seen me wear, I haven't made yet. Um, but um, no, I mean, I'm attracted to anything colorful. So maybe instead of tapestry crochet, I could have been a beading artist. I don't know. <laughs> so it, it, I feel like anything that's like colorful and, and, and beautiful, like I'm attracted to doing that. So, um, but also these, a lot of these beading pieces look good with my pieces. So eventually I'll be able to craft the, the right like necklace for the right um, outfit too. So. so you mentioned in one of your interviews that you don't really sell many of your pieces. Um, do you see yourself going into that? Like, do, and I know that you also mentioned that you have hard time pricing it. And this is like the most common conversation I usually have with uh, artists, like fiber artists, because you know, like you spend so many hours creating something like that. How do you put a price sticker on that? Mm -hmm. Like, did anything change in that regard? 
Well, uh, see, people are constantly asking me that they, they're they constantly saying, hey, I want to buy this. Hey, I want to buy this. And I have a hard time letting go of it. <laughs> and so right now I'm not selling anything because I'm really inspired by a lot of my pieces and I want to keep them for the future. So right now I'm actually not selling anything um, and I'm working on personal projects, but I'm constantly getting people messaging me saying like, hey, I want to buy this or hey, make me this. But I have a hard time letting go of the pieces and then also I have a hard time pricing them because I feel like eventually like if if I become a famous artist or anything they might be so worth so much more and if I give them out so early it's, it's a little much it, it, I don't know but then I also have a lot of attachment to it that's the other problem so do you have like an a vision of what you're trying to achieve is that like day by day journey and you're just enjoying the process of it or do you have a dream of like personal exhibition in the museum or i don't know like catwalk somewhere like what how do you What's the dream? yeah what future holds <laughs> that's a hard question for me <laughs> because i haven't thought about it that much in the future other than to say like I just want to continue following my passion, but I don't have a concrete plan of exactly where I want to go. Because I, like some people have presented the idea of a runway and all that stuff, but I can't make these pieces fast enough for to even have a show. And if I did, it'd be like in 20 years. <laughs> right. And then, <laughs> so that runway idea is probably not gonna happen, but I guess if I hired other people to make it, but then it wouldn't be mine. I don't know. And then the other, the idea of exhibitions, that one, I do like that one. And I actually have done two of them in the past. Um, and so maybe perhaps the pieces that I'm gonna keep, I'm gonna have them at exhibits in the future. How does it feel like when you were standing there and I saw this picture of you standing and people admiring your work, how does it feel like to stand in mm. that room and the walls are covered by your art? Honestly, it feels amazing because I really didn't see myself there or ever in this situation in the past. Um, because I, I do think that I like my art, obviously, because I make it, but I honestly didn't necessarily, when I started, I didn't necessarily care whether other people would like it or not. And then being physically present in an exhibition with people like admiring my art and then also asking me more questions about it, I actually didn't see it coming or happening ever because when I was when I first started crochet I only um which was like in 2010 I only um at that time I was working in pharmacy school and I said okay I'm just going to be a pharmacist and this is going to be my life but then at that time this this also started and then I, I actually didn't expect the reaction people would have so I didn't even see it coming and so for me when I'm physically there I, I'm in awe like I can't believe that it's real either well, you introduce yourself to a new person. Mm -hmm. What comes to mind? Like the first thing that you would say, do you introduce yourself as a pharmacist? Do you introduce yourself as a fiber artist? Do you introduce yourself as a language teacher? All three of those, but but mostly it's the art, the tapestry crochet art. So you I usually say sometimes. I'm a tapestry crochet artist, a pharmacist, and a Nahuatl language teacher. Those are my three things. So I do say all three. <laughs> Did it take you some time to like see yourself as a fiber artist or was it like immediate? No, it took it took a while. Um, when I started in 2010, uh, or yeah, I started in 2010, but it took me about three years to figure out my technique. And when I posted uh, my first piece, well, the first two pieces that, that I spoke about, the little bag and then the, the little flower, I, I posted them, but nobody really like paid attention to it. And I was, I was okay with that because I honestly didn't have any high expectations for them. And then my um, first real big um, tapestry crochet pieces, which is the one with the picture of me um, as a dancer, that one, um, that was the first one that I posted that got a decent amount of reaction. I would say like, 60 or so likes on Facebook, let's say. But then it wasn't like something crazy or explosive or not something that went viral. But once I posted that, I would say the fourth piece, I guess, if you come, yeah. Um, with the one with uh, Erica, the folkloric dancer, that one went really viral and I really didn't see it coming. And so for those, for those first four postings, I didn't really see myself at all as an artist. And I just thought like, oh, <laughs> 
let me show you what I made. <laughs> Look at this, like, isn't this nice? Isn't this pretty? And, like really not having high expectations because I, honestly, I would have made it whether people thought it was pretty or not. <laughs> I would have made it regardless. Um, so how did, your, uh, how did your family react to like when that piece went viral, when suddenly like everybody mm -hmm. was in awe of what you do? Uh, well, my mom especially was like shocked and surprised. And she was like, she's like, Diego, I only taught you how to crochet like the simplest <laughs> things. <laughs> and, and you come back with this. That's <laughs> what <So> she said. <laughs> I taught you the basics and you come back with this. And I was like, yeah, I mean, this is it. <laughs> That's how my mom reacted. Um, the rest of my family is just very like surprised and I would say supportive. Um, I, I don't know if they saw it coming or not, but um, they've always kind of seen me as like a very smart person. And so I, I don't necessarily think that they're surprised, but I was. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's talk about you becoming a language teacher. So when you were growing up, you spoke Spanish and then English, right? You did yeah. not sp speak the Nava. Correct. Uh -huh. So how did that come into your life? <clears throat> um, so, man, this like, I feel like my story is like the same. <laughs> um, so uh, it all goes back to, everything was go goes back to college. <laughs> um, so in college, when I was taking those history classes, um, a lot of the classes about the history of Mexico had a lot of Nahuatl words in them so they would say like oh like this is the name of the the emperor at that time or or even not even just that they would have like names about like society societal names like Masewali which means person um, they had things like that in the literature when I was reading and I got very curious um, what those words meant so I, I at that time was when I started first thinking like I want to learn this but it took me like four or five years later after um, when I was in pharmacy school. So I was in, in undergraduate at UC San Diego is when I first started taking those history classes. But four or five years later in pharmacy school is when I actually got serious about learning. And I don't exactly remember how I just started, but I did download, get a book on Amazon um, to learn now what. And that's what really started everything. So, I mean, is that your approach to everything in life? You just get an idea and then you <laughs> get the book and then before anybody understands what happens, you're a pro? Honestly, yes. <laughs> but the problem, yes. Uh, the problem is that I have a lot of ideas of what I want to do and then I go and do them and then, and then go find another idea that I really like and then go and do that. And somehow I, I end up doing well, but I, yeah, that is, that is, that's, that's kind of how I am. I've so always now, been that way. So now you basically like you fluent in the language to the point where you became a teacher and you decided to post some of those classes on YouTube. Tell me a little bit about how that whole thing started. Like when you first offered to teach, how many people were there interested in learning? Oh, yeah. Let me tell you about that. Um, so I started this about a year ago, a year and a half ago in August of 2021 no no August 2020 I started in August 2020 um well for years I, I've been learning now what since 2013 and so for years I've, I've just always been a learner until I got to a point where I could finally speak with somebody so around like 2020 ish I started doing like uh face-to-face -face, uh practice sessions with native with a native speaker and that's how I got, became really good at actually speaking and then once I had done that, which was back in 2020, um, I finally felt like I was there at that level where I could actually teach somebody because I knew enough. And for years, when while I was learning, people would constantly ask me, like, Diego, could you make a class? But I, for so long, I didn't actually feel like I could do it because I didn't I didn't think I was at the right level where I could explain things or actually speak and, and, and um, answer questions. Even though I, the whole time I've actually been able to understand most of it um, and most answer most questions, I, was, I just didn't feel like I was at the right level yet. And so in August 2020, I had finally had almost a year of practice of actually speaking. And then I felt like I was ready, like it was time. And uh, for, uh, a, for a couple of years in, um, here in Los Angeles, I was teaching in person 
for maybe from 2018 to 2020, I was just teaching very small groups. So that's how I started getting comfortable with actually teaching people specifically in small groups. But when I did the internet class um, at that level, I finally felt comfortable. And honestly, I'm gonna tell you that the reception for that class was like crazy and out of this world because I was so inundated with messages. I had, I started, I posted it like, I think it was August and I, I, I wanted it to be free because I wanted the information to be 100% free for anybody. And I posted on my uh, Instagram and on my art page on Facebook and my post went so crazy. I got like 700 messages. It was, it was so crazy for like a week. I couldn't almost sleep because I was getting message, 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 share, 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 share. And it was so crazy. And um, I had a, on that first week I had 80 people per four sessions. So I would say that was like 300 ish people who actually showed up after I got those 700 messages. And so the reception was crazy. And I never, <laughs> I, I, I honestly did it cause like kind of spontaneously like, oh, let me just have a class. I only, I only expected maybe like 20, 30 people but it went too crazy. And um, yeah, and now I kind of have to do it. <laughs> now so I have a consistent Who are your students? <laughs> One of my students, a lot of them are, uh, a lot of people are like me that they want to recover their roots. So I get a lot of people who are um, living in the United States who are Mexican, but uh, want to learn a native language. So I get a lot of, I would say that's most my most common students. Okay. Although I did have students in Mexico and stuff, but mostly are from here in the United States. Okay. So what did you learn by teaching? Like, what was, how do you see yourself as a teacher today versus like that first uh, lesson? Patience. You learn patience as a teacher. <laughs> I would say that me as, as my personality, as you can see, is kind of erratic. It's kind of like back and forth. It's very quick. And what I have a hard time with is slowing down. And I have a hard time um, slowing down for other people. And so that in my personal life generally causes me to be very impatient. And so one thing that I learned when I was teaching those small groups in class is that I can't be impatient. I have to go at other people's levels and I have to uh, teach things slowly because not everybody understands things the same way. So I would say the biggest thing I learned is patience um, and actually listening and not getting frustrated when somebody doesn't understand and instead trying to explain something slightly different because they might get it in a slightly different way. But I would say patience. Patience is what I've learned. Actually, it's interesting because like when people think about five artists, when people think about like people who like knit or crochet for endless hours, right? To create one piece, they mm. think that we possess a lot of patience. And mm. the funny part that I found that most of us are very impatient and the reason <laughs> why we do it so fast is because we want to get to the next thing and like do something yeah. else and learn something else and try something else. Like, is that you? That's exactly me. People are constantly on my Instagram commenting, oh, you're so patient. And I tell, I always go, look, it's not actually patience, it's passion. <laughs> it's wanting to get it done. <laughs> it's it, like not caring about the time. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. It's almost like obsession. More of, yeah, it's more of an obsession than it is patience. <laughs> the patience just has to happen, but I don't necessarily, you know, care. It's more, I have to do this. It must get done and I don't care how long it takes. <laughs> so you don't charge for language classes you don't sell your art mm -mm. you um i mean is that something you're thinking about doing in the future like are you trying to at some point mm -hmm. turn it into a career or do you always want to keep it as just a hobby like a hobby oh see yeah it's, it's a hard thing because in my regular career profession i make really good money and so the life of an artist is more unstable and the um, and it's less predictable. And I kind of want something that's predictable and stable. So that's why I chose pharmacy in the first place. It was something that was very practical, predictable. It's always gonna be there. There's always a demand for healthcare. So that's why I made that choice in the beginning and discovering later that I was an artist and people have asked me that, why don't you just become a full-time artist? I probably could but it's scary <laughs> because the life of an artist is unstable it's unpredictable and the the whole starving artist stereotype that exists and i'm like well i don't want to be starving 
<laughs> I want to eat. <laughs> I want to eat. <laughs> so that's okay, it. Talking so, of I don't know. eating, you mentioned to me that you like really spicy food and you have really high spice tolerance. Yes. Um, was that always the case or did you discover it like late, later in life? Well, in my family, it's a tradition that everybody eats spicy food. So I started at at least five years old. I don't even remember how early I started, but I started so early that it's been my whole life. So honestly, it's just been that way for like all my life. So my tolerance is just high because I have so much exposure to it practically every day. Right. Well, when you when it comes to food, are you like an adventurous eater? Like, will you also look at food as something like your background going back to your roots kind of thing? No, I'll try anything. I'll try anything. Um, uh, I wouldn't say that I go out and look for restaurants just to try stuff out. But if I'm at a restaurant, I'll try. I'll try different things until I find something that I like. Will you um, ask for like hot sauce with everything that you order? <laughs> Oh yeah, why? Well, yeah, like I'll go to a Thai food place. I'll say, make it extra, 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 extra spicy, <laughs> <laughs> and then it comes back, and I don't think, oh, I go, I go, not spicy enough. <laughs> it's too much. It's so funny because like <laughs> two of my best friends are like also addicted to spicy food, and every time I would go out with them, they would ask the chef like make it extra spicy, and when you think it's too spicy, just make it a little bit extra <laughs> spicy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, spicy food is very addictive, and I learned in pharmacy school like that uh, about how it gives you endorphins, and so. It is somewhat of an addictive substance, <laughs> but it's legal. <laughs> How do you manage your day? Like you work from nine to five mm -hmm. and then you teach those classes. And I mean, just to record it and upload it, it takes time. Mm -hmm. And then you yeah. crochet and then you dance occasionally. Like, How do yeah. you manage all of that? Honestly, it's been hard recently, especially because I used to work part time as a pharmacist and now I became full time. But uh, no, I don't have I'm those one of those people that doesn't have a lot of free time. I'm constantly working on some kind of project or doing something that I'm just like, ah, I don't have any time. So, um, no, I don't manage it well. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> I just do it as, as I see it. And when it comes, when I have to. What's a social media like for you? Like, how do you, is it love hate relationship? How do you use it? Who did you meet there? Like, how does it change your life? Mm -hmm. um, no, I, I have a, uh, I would say a love relationship. I don't have a love hate relationship. And I, I guess maybe because I don't go on social media to compare myself to other people. I only go to social media to post what I'm excited about. And so I know that there's a lot of, uh, theories out there that social media makes you feel less of yourself and that people feel worse by going on social media but what I do is I don't go and like scroll to make myself worse I just go to find things that I like and I try not to compare myself to other people so um and I would say that on the positive side most most of the time it's I've had positive reception, at least on my page. So I haven't had really any negative experiences with social media yet, hopefully never in the future. Um, so I have a very positive outlook of social media. Um, the reception from my art has been amazing. Um, so I'm very happy with that. I'm actually surprised with that. So what gives you the inspiration? Like, is it architecture? Is it like pictures of the places you visited can, or haven't visited? Or is it like other people? It can be anything, honestly. Like, um, but I would say the most of the most of the inspiration it comes from garments, uh, like cultural garments, but it could really be anything. Like I could see gra graffiti and then think, oh my God, these colors are amazing. <laughs> Like these, these colors really go together or I, I love this contrast. So I could use it from practically anywhere. I could be watching a show and I could see like somebody wearing something or, or a background that they have. I'm like, wow, that is amazing. And then I'll keep it like reference for later. And I would say 
that is would be my inspiration but really it's when I see a good color color combination that inspires me I kind of reference it in my mind and when the right time comes it comes out <laughs> don't write anything down there is no like no. any kind of diary or any kind of folder for the future no it's all in your head it's in my head <laughs> And then also when I'm drying stuff out, then I kind of try different colors out until I find the right one. So I don't just um, like, I don't have a vision of like, okay, it's going to look like this. I'll have a general vision and then I'll try it out until it's right. And I'll try so many different combinations until it, it goes right. So you mentioned somewhere that you like buy your yarn in Mexico. Uh, is, mm -hmm. that, is that for ex like again going back to your roots and like using the local yarn or you like their colors better like what speaks to you about that yarn versus what you can get here uh it's the colors the brightness of the colors so um like for example i have a piece here that has a bright pink i can't well i guess i can't find it as bright here as i would uh, in Mexico, but um, I, I generally get it at Mexican, the yarn I get it here in Mexican shops, but it's really the colors. It, uh, it's the intensity of the colors. I've gone to the store and I haven't seen any that are that intense or at least not the right colors. And so it's really just the color uh, combinations. Do you have a favorite color that you always come back to? <laughs> I have two favorite colors. <laughs> uh, and that's, uh, yeah. Um, so I love this um, like teal blue color and red so that's why i love this piece so much <laughs> yeah so red and teal so do you plan ahead of time like do you already have any pieces that like you planning for this year yes i already have uh like three or four that i've already like i know i already drew them out they're already ready to go i'm halfway done through one of them right now um, so I'm about to finish one maybe in two or three months. So you'll see, be seeing the pictures. I'm so excited. <laughs> and then um, I have at least two or three more that I've already drawn out that I think are beautiful. And I'm so excited. And you use Photoshop for your patterns, right? So tell me about <clears throat> that process a little bit. Well, I used to use, use Photoshop, but then it got expensive. So now I found an, an alternative that's free. So I use a free program now called GIMP. Um, but it pretty much does everything that Photoshop does. But when I first started, I was using Photoshop. When I was in college, I learned just randomly, not through a course, on my own, through my own exploration, how to work with Photoshop, manipulate pictures, change, I don't know, all, all these things. But um, when I first created my chart, it, it started in Photoshop and it just started with that idea of, I want to create pictures with crochet. So when this happened in around 20, 2013, when I like kind of figured it out, um, it, and at that time I possessed the, the skills with Photoshop, but didn't know how to make a chart. And so I, I Googled for like three or four days. And then I found how to make tileable pictures. And with that, those tileable pictures, I eventually figured out how to make a hexagon graph. And once I made the hexagon graph, I was able to create practically any picture. So it was kind of a journey of like looking for what I was already looking for, like the right tools. Right. So you now also do classes in 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 the tapestry crochet as well, right? Ah, yeah. So I do. Mm -hmm. uh, like, why did you decide to teach others how to do it your way? Mm -hmm. um, because, well, people are always asking me to make them something <laughs> and I'm like I don't have time for to make you something so I'm gonna have you make yourself something <laughs> that's one of the reasons other reason is people were always asking me since the beginning like how are you crocheting because they saw like how good my color changes are so they were like how is it that you get it so perfectly and and I told them at the time it's because I use my own technique but I can't really explain to you what my own technique is and like I don't know two minutes I can't do that so I created the whole course to, to basically answer or explain my technique because I constantly get those questions on the internet. So people can just buy that course and do it at their own pace, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what can they expect to learn at the end of the course? Uh, 
at the end of the course, they can, they will learn how to switch colors the way that I switch colors. They'll learn how to do backward tapestry crochet. So inserting the hook from front to back instead of from back to front. Um, they will, at the end of the course, I have a, uh, a small pillow that kind of puts the whole, my whole technique together. And I go step by step on showing you how to actually make the pillow so you could actually see my process of what I, I do when I create a piece. Now it's a very small pillow, but pretty much the, the technique that I use for that is what I use for all of my pieces. Right. Well, I can't wait to see what else you're gonna create. I love seeing your pictures. Besides the fact that they're colorful and so pretty, they really bring happiness to the world, I feel like. So it's very defeating with your name, you know? Well, speaking of that, I have my other piece that I'm gonna make. And by the time this video comes out, it's probably gonna be out. So you could get a preview of what's coming. Let me show you one moment. Oh, that's exciting. All right. So I'm working on another cape and this is what it looks like so far. <laughs> Promise to turn on the music. What goes what on, on fiber like so chat far. stays on fiber chat. <laughs> yeah. oh, that's beautiful. So it's so, going to be a cape. And I'm so excited. So excited to show the world. But I'm only halfway done. So what was the idea behind that? How did you come up with that image? Well, this has to do with being LGBT. So it's, it's two um, same-sex uh, partners looking at each other in love. And basically it's, it's about feeling free um, with loving whoever you love. So that's, that's the idea between that one. So they have wings, they're flying in the air, they're looking at each other in love. And that is what I'm trying to express in this piece. That's beautiful. Well, thank you so much, Diego, for being my guest today. I really love talking to you. And mm -hmm. can't wait to see what else you're going to create. <laughs> oh, I'm so excited. <laughs> oh, I have some ideas. You don't understand. Oh, like I just need time to be like, <laughs> honestly, because I already know what they're going to look like and I'm so excited. Oh. Okay, so let me hold on. Let me just turn this thing off.